behalf of the Raza Foundation and the India Habitat Center. Uh, we are very happy and we uh, offer a very warm welcome and our gratitude to Rubina Karode for having agreed to deliver the third Gaitonde Memorial Lecture. She has decided to talk this evening on Nasreen Mohamdi and Jiram Patel, the gravity of line and mass. May I invite Rubina Ji? Thank you, Ashok Ji, the Raza Foundation and the India Habitat Center for inviting me to speak on the occasion of the third Gaitonde Memorial Lecture. Thank you all for being here. This is an area of work that I have been immersed in for a long time, and yet I feel empty. Um, the Kiranada Museum of Art has had some finest Gaitonde works in its collection and has been deeply invested in engaging with the pioneering efforts in abstraction in India in the early 1950s, 60s onwards. Somehow artists such as Nasreen Mohammadi, Hemad Shah, Jairam Patel have remained underrepresented despite their contributory expeditions in abstraction in modern India. And that was one of the efforts that was made at the museum to really excavate and comprehend uh, their practices, their journeys, uh, which have been uh, long enough to cover many decades. Abstraction and representation have always had to confront each other throughout the history of modernism. One notices quasi-abstract tendencies in the works of the preceding generations, especially the Bombay progressives. There was a surge towards abstractions in the 50s and 60s in India that somehow got obscured by the dominant mainstream figural narrative discourse that laid significance on the new foundation and identity formation. In its multiple variants in Bombay, Madras, and Delhi, artists who worked in the abstractionist mode were deemed limiting to the discourse on Indian modernism on the charge that their affiliations were clearly seen as aligned to the West and to Greenberg's universal idea of high modernism. Alternately, for the language of abstraction to be accepted within the national, artists took recourse to ind indigenous insertions through esoteric diagrams, mandalas, numbers, decorative folk elements, or tantric imagery, only to be criticized for the revivalist flavor of a deliberate Indianness. The belated attention and recognition to artists who refrained from both, such as Nasreen, Jairam, and even Gaitonde, can partly be explained through this. They worked their way through modes of excavation, erasure, and economy of material and medium. The lure of abstraction as one of the many languages for artists to call upon in the past century emphasized the urge to withdraw from the world of appearances, strip away the surface, to reach an essence. Call it transcendence, self-healing, entering the realm of the liminal and the spiritual. The capacity to grasp purity or essence proved as elusive as the terminology which frames it. The history of abstraction reads as a series of attempts to deal with its closed self-referentiality, as well as a search for formal expression that goes beyond the limits of representation. Non-representational form, non-objective form, was anticipated in the discourse of music, in symbolist thought and literature. The effect character of music inspired several artists both in the West as well as in India. Spirituality in its widest sense became for many the backbone of the pursuit of abstraction. I start with an image of young Jaram Patel and the quintessential image of the modern artist. Non-conformist, experimental, wild, daring, emblematic of an untamed spirit. Subsumed in his work, he is poised with both the body and spirit immersed in it. Seeking new materials and inventing the process of working as he goes along performing on the canvas spread on the ground, digging as if into the dark loam. In his early works, we find him mixing spirits and grittiness of material, tempera mixed with sand, plaster, polymer, zinc white, fevicol, etc., creating an unpremeditated image through instinctive workings. Mystery takes over conscious and learned ways of making art. As early as in 1962, 
Jeram started working with a blow torch or a blow lamp that bites into the naked skin of the wood, its fiery flame extracting nuances out of matter. He picked up rectangular pieces of wood, bored holes, charred its contours, covered some areas with crusty black enamel. Some critics reviewed the work expressing surprise as to why the young painter, painter who had consumed skill to render the human form, had taken on what seemed a meaningless occupation of burning holes into wood. Artists in periods of political or personal turmoil are indeed driven to search for meaning in a seemingly meaningless world. Jeram painting with a searing flame replied, fire may not always destroy, it can also create. Destructive forces can also lead to creation. The nailing of wood and metal fragments and see-through perforations made by Jeram speak of a violent confrontation with materiality, excavating the image from within. He even welded enamel black into wood by the burning torch, difficult to distinguish from the natural movement of the brown towards the black. His peer artist, Ghulam Ahmad Sheikh, writes in a moving tribute to the artist who passed away in January this year. Jaram Patel was a phenomenon, an artist of exceptional vision, but also a solitary soul. Often described as an overpowering figure, aggressive and agitated, he questioned and talked about the purpose of life, its aimlessness, the dilemmas around belonging, and dying as a process and death as a physical release. All these inquiries inform the physical tactility and violence and the unleashing of fury onto the material. He collapsed categories between painting and sculpture. He broke the conception of painting as a picture to be done on the surface, or sculpture as something carved out of stone or molded in bronze. Any material that he worked with, he transformed it into painting. From flat wood pieces, he went on to burn plywood sheets stuck together to arrive at a charred image, blurring the notions of inside and the outside, destroying their meaning all at once. Here, the wood is the image, and the image is the wood. Craters, hole, crevices seem to process some compelling but inexplicable feeling. The work has a brutal, haunting quality, strangely calm yet ominous, disturbing yet appealing, threatening yet thrilling. In one of the early works on Masonite board in 1962, we encounter a small window of light and a brutal structure seen in the darkness of the night. Could it be the death ground for Holocaust victims? The truth lies buried within. His work of the 50s and 60s express a sense of torment. These drawings on board are small in size, rendered through intimate short stroking using a sharp croquil, a simple drawing device. Evocative, they skewed an emotional force focused on the body and its vulnerability. The human body, charred or evacuated, lies surrounded by medical and surgical devices. Next. Next. that serve as a metaphor, pa metaphor for pain as well as healing. One encounters poignant details such as the injected needle pricking the skin, the body bearing signs of disease and decay, laceration. In their tight patterning, the images seem to traverse the passage between life and death, between fate and mortality. Nasreen Mohammadi, who was younger than Jairam, straddled diverse artistic traditions to arrive at her own form of knowledge and aesthetic necessary to her practice. While she was familiar with the modernist movements in the West and particularly responded to works of Paul Klee, Kandinsky, and Malevich, she was equally drawn to Asian sensibilities in Japanese art, Islamic culture, and Hindu Upanishadic thought on universal essence. In India, there was hardly anyone working, with her, working like her in ink and graphite, and in bare lines. Though admired in her lifetime, Nasreen remained enigmatic and elusive, quite the reflection of her work, a distilled oeuvre that does not lend itself to ordinary comprehension. In the, in the absence of obvious content, titles, or overt imagery, her art confounds readings and subverts interpretation. Through her uncompromising singular pursuit, she arrived at a harmonious melding of the rational and the poetic, the philosophical and the mystical, one driving the other and each empty without the other. As a result, Nasreen's art is of slow evolution and even slower revelation. It steps out of the formal domain to situate itself in the realm of transcendence. One of the early canvases, and by the way, Nasreen 
shunned painting on canvases right in the beginning itself. She must have done hardly five or six canvases in her lifetime. Nasreen was an enigmatic figure. She never theorized her work or spoke about it in detail. In the absence of uh, any obvious content, title, or dates, her art, though admired, remained elusive. Oil on canvas was the most prevalent artistic medium used by Mohammadi's peers then, but she was never enamored of the medium and painted only a few canvases before shunning it. Against the lure of a forgiving medium that allows for revision and reworking, she preferred the transparency of watercolor and ink, accepting the challenges of irreversibility. She explored the sensitivity of graphite and ink in both her freehand drawing and her geometric abstraction. She embraced the delicacy and fragility of paper, abolishing practically everything but line. Her experiences were distilled in the subtle rhythms of a geometry manifested in flowing experiences, in flowing lines, meeting, separating, crossing over, and sometimes left floating. She carried this inclination to the extreme, arriving at a remarkably pristine oeuvre of austere linear drawings that repeatedly invoke infinity, void, and nothingness. Formless in form, these abstract notions work best as metaphors associated with the final truth. Nasreen herself died prematurely at the age of 53, having lived much of her life with the consciousness of her impending death. Her afflicted body was a constant reminder of this unsettling truth, as was watching her two elder brothers battle the same genetic illness. Troubled from a young age by the ephemeral ephemerality of the body, she silently nurtured a desire to circumvent and even transcend it. The sensibilities of Gaitonde, who was in one sense uh, a mentor for a while, the sensibilities of Gaitonde and Nasreen met over the sea. Nasreen's works in the early 60s, especially her canvases, retained the texture of being washed by the sea, cleansed of all excess, with only a few apparitions of perceptible forms. The opaque, opaqueness of the oil paint was amply diluted to bring upon the translucent mistiness of watercolor, which you saw in her earlier canvas, and delicately register a few faint traces of the physical world, which is what she does very, very sensitively. Gaitonde believed that between the painter and the canvas, no historical dimension or human condition exists. The statement was radical at the time when India as a newly independent nation state encountered the contradictions of modernity that sparked unease as well as excitement among artists. Debates around the texture of an Indian modernism were heating up with the vexed questions of nationalism and identity. The building of a national identity in art was perceived as a necessary agenda and an immediate responsibility and artists pushed their art practice to engage the socio-political context. The abstract emerged as a significant parallel trajectory, uh, its practitioners following no single style, but seeking a new language to speak to the world. The diary entries from this period are full of psychic turmoil and her fight with the supposedly benevolent God. She writes in her diary, a terrible void, how to comprehend. In several of the diary entries, next, in several of the diary entries from the 1960s, one can see hints of a premonitory tone concerning her troubled destiny, her shaken faith, and her illustrations with the futility of any action. One might even conjecture that under the duress of this time, she became aware of the first fatal signs of her affliction as dormant symptoms began to surface. Having painted only a few canvases, Nasreen shunned working on the easel soon after this decade and never returned to the medium. One might ask whether her interest was weaned by the messiness of oil as a medium, the frequent need to squeeze tubes and mix pigments, the requirement of multiple brush sizes, the excess on the tray, or whether she rejected the orientation of the easel demanding a frontal relationship with the canvas. She wrote, need to simplify. She would constantly remind herself. There was much more for her to give up in order to arrive at the frugal means and sparse aesthetics she finally abided by. In time, Nasreen renounced human figuration, objects of the world, the easel and the canvas, the warm palette of colors, even the large size format, to embrace fully the delicacy and fragility of paper, which was closer to her sensibility, abolishing everything but line. While artists of a generation seeking to unfold complex narratives or becoming more ambitious with the size of their canvases, Nasreen's work grew smaller and smaller in size and more economical in means, less by intent more by intuition. Between transparency and opacity, surface and structure, 
the torn and cut edge transputes the phenomena observed through ways of wailing and manifesting. Her illness had begun to disrupt her normal motor functions. As the tremble of her hand became more difficult to hide, as you can see in the lines that she's drawing, as the tremble of her hand became more difficult to hide, Nasreen felt the need to shield herself from an imped impediment that would be dev devastating for any artist. A switch to working with precision instruments was one practical solution and a valid reason for a reorientation of a practice. It is from her that I learned that the world is too much with us throughout the day and there is a need to withdraw from the world. There is a need to actually withdraw from everything and just reflect and sit still and think about your center, think about yourself. That was one thing. The other thing was she always talked about decluttering spaces. You have to unclutter, you have to unclutter. Whatever is not needed, Whatever is excess, whatever is unnecessary, needs to be shunned, needs to go. Unless you create an emptiness in you, there can be nothing that can enter you. So this creating an empty center was extremely important and she would often refer to the Sufi dance. When they dance and they go around and they swirl, uh, their, their movement is basically, they want to lose their ego in that moment and empty out so that the light can emanate within, the light can reach within, the light of knowledge can reach within you. This uncluttering was extremely important for her. And so when she made this shift, it was not easy for her because she had to really discipline herself. She had to practice meditation. She had to practice stillness while the body was involuntary moving and shifting all the time. The grids and geometry she leaned toward in the 1970s were not without any precedent, without precedent. Russian constructivists in the West, Piet Mondrian, Barnard Newman, and Malevich. Closer to home were the Asian Eastern mystical traditions that relied on geometry for a symbolic manifestation of the universe and its creative force. The geometric layouts of mandalas of temple architecture consecrated the ground with grids that represented cosmological diagrams. She was particularly drawn to Islamic culture and its Sufic interpretation in architecture. Its surface patterns in the form of calligraphic inscriptions and arabesques which Nasreen observed during her trips to is Isfahan, Istanbul, and the Mughal monuments in India, particularly to architecture. Architecture reflected the world of archetypes through symbols, the cosmic processes working through numbers, and their cosmological meanings attributed in geometry. This is why she leaned towards mathematics as an abstract language. Mathematics as an abstract language helped her transit from a sensible to an intelligible world. Somehow in her photography, quite like her drawings, her vision remains austere. The easy capture of the stimuli around did not lure her to effusiveness or to filling up the frame. Her eye operated within a similar restraint with the same sense of economy that one encounters in her drawings, paring down unnecessary elements to frame a contemplative image. In her photographs, the perceptible world is extracted into an abstract configuration of lines, shapes, textures, patterns, and light. Location is often obscured in Nasreen's photographs by framing that selects the essential and makes the larger context redundant. For instance, people who would have not seen Fatehpur Sikri would, would not realize that this is Fatehpur Sikri. The domes, arches, the obvious signs of Islamic architecture and culture are not there because she's so focused on the ground, you know, something that really interested her. The ground, the path, the pathways. And, and especially here, we know the reasons why Fatehpur Sikri was deserted because there was no water. The shortage of water is why Akbar had to leave and desert the city. And this little neher is empty. And that emptiness was something that really she responded uh, to when she took this picture. <clears throat> Rarely are our photographs mimetic portraits of places, objects, or nature sites. Perhaps the memory of sight was significant for Nasreen, but whether it served any revelatory aim in her photographs is unclear. For instance, the city site locale in many of her photographs remains untraced and one is left to conjecture. She did spend a lot of time by the sea and in the desert places where light always presents itself in high contrast and shadows appear as intense apparitions. Her photographs also validate her alertness to the ephemeral shadow on the wall 
even as in patterns on sand, the blinding effects of stark sunlight, and the dematerialization of matter, the instant capture of the passing phenomena, the immediacy of a water droplet, bubbles of sea foam appearing and disappearing on the wash shores in a series of images, all poetic expressions about the transience of life. She made a small note in a diary entry. Next. I have to go back now. Go back a few. Ground serves the purpose of the screen, and somewhere later, filigree in dust. Many of Nasreen's photographs are about shifting, tilting the lens onto the ground, enlivened by patterns and shadows that unfold the theater of time and space. Her photographs are also about pathways, pavements, airstrips, trails, and alleys. They form paths of visions, diagonals, a sharp edge amplifying the movement of the eye from here to beyond, taking the view to infinity. That's how the title of the show came. Geometry, with its inherent duality, became her means to interweave the inward and the outward, the spatial and the temporal, the manifest and the hidden. As her health deteriorated, Nasreen grew calmer. She was less agitated and more meditative. She became less interested in expending energies in things that would draw her outward. She spoke less, preferring silence, knowing that truth was most easily reached therein. She sought transcendence. Her work is always situated in the rubric of minimalism in the West, because it's not just about a formal language. I think Nasreen is very much about a symbolic language. It is something that she arrived, she's completely, she is using her inner resources her, to understand and to uh, live her life in the way she wants to live, the way she wants to proceed, the way she wants to embrace uh, uh, sublimity and liminality. And uh, uh, you see in her diaries references to many of these things. For instance, a lot of her works use the number nine or number seven. Now, these seem like numbers when you count that these are seven or there are nine such uh, images, nine triangles or nine, uh, what to say, planes. Uh, it's almost like uh, the seven planes of existence. They exist in Upanishad, they exist in Sufic idea, and uh, you know they are always shifting and they are actually moving towards the unknown. That she was, uh, when she uh, studied Sufic, um, she in fact even gifted me a book on Sufism. She was, Lufi, uh, she was understanding architecture, and when you look at Islamic architecture, in fact I think it's also in other forms of architecture, there is always water. And water is always there near the form. One is that it's plenitude, it's oh, the mosque or any Islamic architecture is open to air, open to light, and therefore open to shadows. The other thing is that when, it, when you see any concrete form and you see the shadow of it, the architecture talks about the visible phenomena, the concrete phenomena, and the shadow talks about impermanence. And that's the beauty of it, and that goes together. And in Nasreen's work, it's always working with a sense of shadow. She always worked with a sense of shadow. Nasreen transits into another plane of existence, of being. Like the Sufis and Zen Buddhists, Nasreen had come closer to grasping the barest form of life. Her art acquired an ethereal presence while in a gentle transition from material to the immaterial world and from a physical to a non-physical space. Planes, Nasreen's planes and emerging tri triangles appeared as delicate traceries without enclosed boundaries, sometimes in multiples one elevated from the other, gently moving in their lightness of being. Even as they overlap, their form remains fully visible because of the transparency of their pure existence. The drawings are now reminders of incantations, reverberations, sound, vibrations of light, and cosmic rhythms, orchestrated like a symphony. From the mistiness of her agitated and anguished lines to a calm and illum illuminated interiority, Nasreen indeed traversed a long distance. Simon Weil writes, the world is closed door, it is a barrier, and at the same time, it is the way through. Nasreen had found a way from the mundane into the mystical realm. Unattached and alone in a state of elevated consciousness, she freed herself from the burden of the haunting mortal body, entering into a liminal zone. The airiness of Nasreen's last works mark a spiritual ascent from the ground where the anguish of the mundane is released to embrace a pure vision. Thank you. <laughs>